Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 573. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I am Gavin Ashenden, and it's the 11th of February, 2020. All right, welcome to another program of Anglican Unscripted, where I sit down with my two favorite people and we talk about Christian news, Anglican news, the world of news uh, that just appears before our, our kind of screens here throughout the week and we think you need to know about because uh, it's just fun stuff to talk about. It's crazy stuff most of the time. And I say that because I just watched a lot of video from General Synod at the Church of England, but we'll get to that a little bit later. Before we get started, you as a viewer can help this program by clicking the like button on Facebook or YouTube. You can subscribe to the program by clicking the red subscribe button on the YouTube channel. You can listen to the podcast. If you look at the show notes on our YouTube channel, you'll see a link to our podcast. If you don't like to look at, uh, look at these look good looking guys. If you don't want to look at us, you just want to listen to us. There's a podcast. A lot of people uh, do that on their way to work. They click in Anglican Unscripted. And I'm going to tell you a secret. Anglican Unscripted episodes never end. Once I click stop and I click upload, they come alive again in the comments. Hundreds and hundreds of comments each episode about what you like, what you didn't like, what you thought, and sometimes, Kevin, I think your shirt's on backwards. You know, just stuff like that. And so we appreciate all you, you say in the comments. Uh, for some reason, we're, we have not been hit by trolls in a long time. We appreciate that. Uh, maybe it's just because we don't respond to trolls or we delete them, whatever. Gentlemen, let's move on to the news. Uh, I watched something that was so disheartening. Now, I've been to, I think, two general synods of the uh, uh, Church of England, I think back in 2010 and 2011, uh, when they were trying to decide whether or not to recognize the ACNA uh, as part of uh, what, was, what was going to be the future of the Church of England. Now I'm watching just the best of social justice warriors sitting down and talking about the things that really excite them and the gospel is not one of them gavin it's it's hard to watch this this uh, I, I don't want to use words that are too offensive but this offensive um, show about the church i was surprised at two things i think one when i tuned in uh if it's possible to gauge an atmosphere through one screen the atmosphere as i listened to questions and them dealing with safeguarding seemed very really unhappy indeed i think there are good reasons of being unhappy when you're empathizing with people's pain and wanting to stand alongside them and there are bad reasons when you're involved in a car crash institutionally and it, it felt much too much like the latter i'm afraid so one of the things i, I found difficult was the atmosphere but the other I found difficult was the way in which I thought I noticed people who follow progressive Christianity going out of their way to adopt language that was essentially very evangelical. Uh, all, all the all the good gospel words, you know, the way in which sometimes ev we evangelicals can identify each other. We 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 throw in a bit of gospel language and see whether it's you know batted back in the right way and that christ you know, that, has transformed me <laughs> you're one of us yes, that, yeah i know what you're talking about yes and that and that's fine we all have we all have semiotic signals by which we see whether or not the other person is friendly or, or understands us actually but i've noticed the thing that i'm really noticing is the way in which a progressive christianity is clothing itself in the language of traditionalism uh, it, and I, I think in order to gain an extra credibility, either to persuade themselves that they are the traditionalists uh, or to wrong foot people for whom that kind of traditionalist language will be a signal that we're on the same side. It's done quite well, and, and uh, it, I think it's being very confusing. George, you've watched these before, and I, I, you've certainly seen the trajectory from... Uh, I think I first started watching these when they were discussing whether or not uh, there should be uh, women bishops uh, within the Church of England. 
And now it's no longer a discussion really about growing the church. Their idea of surviving is how can we survive as environmentalists? How can we survive as feminists? How can we survive as social justice warriors? Uh, as far as I can tell, the gospel, as I define it, no longer exists in the Church of England. I would agree with your sentiments, Kevin, but I would uh, try to winnow it down a bit. Where is this coming from? I want to divide synod between uh, its members and its leadership. There are a good number of godly men and women who are members of General Synod who have a hunger and burning desire to bring Christ to the world. Some of them uh, may not agree on what is the top priority. There are people who are profoundly motivated by their, by their faith uh, to get involved in envir environmentalism. There are others who are profoundly motivated uh, to bring the Bible f uh, front and center. And I think that's a wonderful discussion to have. And, I, I don't, and when I look at the motives and I see what lies behind that, that's a great thing. What that runs up against is the failure of leadership in the institution of Church House and of the Church of England and among the leaders of the bench of bishops. What you have is institutional self-preservation and you've created a culture of cant and dishonesty. So we have, for instance, so uh, this didn't take place at General Synod, but we have the Bishop of Portsmouth putting out a letter uh, essentially rubbishing the traditional teaching of the church on human sexuality, but using the buzzwords Gavin mentions saying that we're uh, seeking a gospel of inclu uh, holy inclusivity. And in other words, he's, he's creating categories and ideas that are profoundly anti-Christian, that regeneration and repentance does not mean turning away from sin and putting your focus on Jesus Christ. It means, it means being nice to the current uh, calls of the day, and sitting down, shutting up, and letting your betters run the show. What we have right now at General Synod is a profoundly unchristian, in fact, anti-Christian culture. The greatest crisis, among the many great crises, but a profound crisis is the abuse crisis. That, is, that discussion's been shut down. We had written questions submitted on Jonathan Fletcher, General Synod members can submit questions which will be answered by a designated representative from the National Church offices. And the, and the answers to the Jonathan Fletcher questions are, sit down, shut up, don't bother us. In the fullness of time, after we've learned the lessons and after the right people have retired from their positions and no longer can be bothered, mm. we'll eventually tell you what we think. But in, in other words, it was so haughty and dismissive of a profound concern. We had two lay members of Synod bring to forward a motion on behalf of survivors of clergy abuse. And these are not things that have just happened. Justin Welby has been well aware for eight years in some cases of the abuse and we have Justin Welby in some forums saying we must listen to survivors, we must reach out to them, we must talk to them, except he doesn't listen, he doesn't reach out, he doesn't talk, he takes the advice of the attorneys to shut these people up, to fight tooth and nail to preserve the finances of the church. And so a motion was presented to do more than just acknowledge and bewail our manifold sins and wickedness, but actually do something. Well, of course, this was ruled out of order by a committee. So we'll have a discussion of uh, clergy abuse crisis, but it will be term cast in terms of, we'll leave the bishops to sort this all out because they're smarter than we are and holier than we are, even though the whole problem with the abuse crisis is the failure of the bishops and leadership to act. This is what I mean by being unchristian. I could take this across so many levels. Uh, in past, it, past meetings of synod, we've had booing and hissing I don't know if it's occurred this time around, but when a person like Andrea Williams will stand up and offer an orthodox position, we, we will have people act as if they're in parliament and they are razzing the opposition rather than seeking to divine God's will for what should be a holy institution. The, uh, see, the Episcopal Church's General Convention is a clown conference. It's, it's clown <laughs> college. It's been that way for 25, 30 years. And people who go there know it's a clown college. 
and it has no standing or spiritual authority whatsoever. I mean, if I was to jump after every uh, resolution, you know, resolutions come out of general convention, call us to f agitate for freeing Mumia Abu Jamal from prison in Pennsylvania, or ban guns and cigarette smoking in churches, and you know, stuff that they have no ability to enforce or have any uh, competency to speak on. So it's all ignored. It basically gives uh, uh, sort of those horrible kids in high school who are members of the Model UN uh, and the debating society. Now that they're adults and they're in second tier jobs and don't have real responsibility in life, they can pretend to be important and influential. So they go off to general convention, spend millions of dollars, waste people time. That's a given in the Episcopal church. It's, and, but the thing is the Church of England is holding that up as the model of what they want to be. They want yeah. to take the worst aspects of what the Episcopal Church has become and make it their model of Christian living. It's, and I think it's that's silly. where they, they, they've sunk up, synced up with the Episcopal Church you know, ethos. The last video I saw with Justin Welby was telling me there's a climate emergency. You know, the, and that we, we need to drop everything we're doing and address the climate emer emergency. Justin, your church has a gospel emergency. It's not there anymore. You have no good news. You have nothing to offer society, but you will take everything society offers you as the gospel. I want to talk. I want to talk. Let me okay, go, 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 go. And I'll let Gavin, I'll let Gavin explain. <laughs> Justin Welby's presidential address, here's a perfect example of what Gavin was saying. He uses the language of spiritual warfare, which, as I understand it, is the warfare between Satan and the enemy and the kingdom of God. But what is what is Justin Welby's spiritual warfare about, Kevin, uh, Gavin? What is he talking about? Is he talking about <laughs> Satan? I think this is why this is where we I think we began with the right theme. And the right theme is is uh, using language to justify oneself but changing its meaning and so uh, yes Justin Welby talked about the the, uh, the the lion that prowls around seeking whom he may devour the national newspapers got this got this a little bit wrong and wondered if he was talking about safari safari park philia um, because they they can't imagine he'd be talking about the devil but but the devil for Justin Welby appears to be um, a, a well, it, it's very difficult to, to say. Let me back up a bit and say I don't quite agree with George as he, as he bestows admiration upon the spirituality of Synod members. Some, I, I think what, some, some, some. I Eagle mean, what, what Synod, Synod has, to, it's a big committee and it has to do things like look to the uh, letter of the law as regards churchyards. It has to consider the complete failure of the clergy disciplinary measure. There are things it has to do as a committee, but when it becomes spiritual or evangelical, its two evangelical areas are climate change and sexuality. Those are the areas where people put their passion and their integrity in. And the problem with climate change is that, well, it doesn't even need talking about. We, you know, we we all know what the problem with the climate change is. Is that it is it is not up to the church to teach the world how to manage its carbon emissions or to do the complicated science that takes you one way or the other uh, and describe the integration with industrialization. The church doesn't have any particular mm -hmm. wisdom on that. And in terms of sexualization, what's happened is the small groups of people at either end, the Catholic faithful and the evangelical faithful, who took the traditional view on Christian anthropology, um, have, sorry, I'm just whoa, being... Uh, I don't get many phone calls, but that was one. If that's Pope people. Francis, you can't hang up. You can't. You <laughs> don't go ghosting Pope Francis. No, it wasn't Pope Francis. <laughs> okay, all right. At least it didn't come through with his number. Um, uh, so the the, the 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 faithful evangelicals and the faithful Catholics who maintain a biblical anthropology have got smaller and smaller as a group, which is why the synod as a whole felt safe enough to boo Andrea Menchella Williams and others, and why they felt safe enough to vote for progressive policies. So the question is, where does the evangelism, where is the gospel that Justin Welby is talking about? How does it express itself uh, in as he uses the language of the kingdom in, in self-defense for his vision? And the answer is, it's all about 
inclusion and belonging. It's it's entirely a spiritual version of the new therapeutic secularism. And if if I can sum it up, somebody asked me about this the other day, and I thought, oh, I think I've I think I've nailed it. Um, and and the, for, for the way I thought I'd nailed it was to say, what what psychotherapy has done is is to present as the supreme value self acceptance. And then we, we, we are taught to put ourselves out there and say to the rest of the world, you must accept me as I'm learning to accept myself and, and score 10 out of 10 on a psychotherapeutic scale. If for any reason you don't accept me as I am, then you're not loving me. And in an increasingly Manichaean therapeutic world, if you don't love me, you're hating me. And so suddenly you have this binary choice of either accepting the therapeutic agenda and affirming people as they think they are, or you're a hater. Now, the problem is Christianity doesn't fit into that, but the Christianity of General Synod has adapted has adapted and adopted that. And we might, in a moment, talk about the signals that they gave about how the living in love and faith agenda is going to come out, because that will be a, a, a an evolution of exactly these issues. Well, let, let's just talk really quick about re the redefinition. And one of the key words I've seen redefined is tolerance. You know, it, it's the word of the, the new sexual generation of LGTB. I forget all the other acronyms uh, involved there. And they define tolerance as you are to affirm me. Not tolerate, but to affirm. And so they redefined it in that way where tolerance really means I will de not demand that you change and you do not demand that I change. You know, it's completely different than uh, the redefinition that they've applied to it. And now they're doing that to the, the spiritual realm of words. And I think it's important that you really pay attention to when they say they've been transformed, what they really mean by being transformed. Well, you're quite right. And, and the, the really interesting thing was repentance. I, I've now got what repentance means in, in general synod lingo speak because they've begun to explain it. Uh, repentance means being very sorry for having had views that no longer conform to what we think they should be. So you must repent of ignorance or prejudice or not understanding the new sexualized inclusivity. We call upon you to repent. This is wonderful because we've been saying for some time now that um, there are three elements to the Christian journey. One is you're loved as you are. Secondly, you're called to repent. And then thirdly, you should be transformed. And the Church of England's done number one and has not looked at number two and number three. There'd be no calls to repentance. They must have been listening to Anglican Unscripted because these calls are coming thick and fast now, except that repentance doesn't mean repent from your sin, as the Bible and Jesus describe it. It means repent of your social sins, uh, of your failure to accept this new therapeutic, progressive, sexualized anthropology. So suddenly we're all talking the same language, except we mean different things. I... Um... Well, well, this is the world of George Orwell, 1984. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Where words are turned around. Um, I know what the word tolerance mean. I have a lathe in my garage, and I was, well, I was machining the rotors of my car, and I take out a micrometer, and I find what the tolerance is that I can use to put back onto this car. So tolerance means between within these certain boundaries. Tolerance in the Church of England means no boundaries. That you can have your rotors so completely warped, so going on here, coming out there, that the car brakes are never going to stop. Now, I don't think everybody appreciates gearhead analogies, but the Church of England's rotors are warped. <laughs> and, their, and the brakes are not going to work. See, the, pra the path... See, here's the... Here's the th and, I know people uh, get irritated when I say this, but the institutional failure does not pull down the parish in most cases, unless it's a, it's, unless it's a failing parish anyway. What you're going to have happen, see, evangelical, traditional Anglicanism is doing very well in the Episcopal Church on the parish level, and it's doing very well in some parishes in the Church of England. And what's going to happen is that we're going to have people basically take the conger route which is congregationalism and paying your taxes to the bishop and seeing him once every two to three years because the bishop has no spiritual authority. And if that's what the Church of England wants, that's what they're going to get. You're going to get some people going off to Rome, 
But for people on my side of the aisle, they'll just get farther and farther and farther estranged away from the national institutions, which meanwhile are running out of money, running out of people. Two thirds of the children's are in congregations like mine, not in the Looney Tune congregations. And demography in a generation is going to have killed off the well behind church. Now what's left? Independence, uh, strange little sex like Congerites, but uh, the dif to George, they, the they've chosen is, death. They've chosen <clears throat> death as a denomination. They have, but but let me give voice to the interim pain because people are feeling it very badly. Um, although you've quite rightly said there is a congregational uh, solution, the, the the foxhole of the of 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 the group of believers who believe truly. Part of the problem is that I keep on getting letters from people saying we were um, we were a wholesome Bible believing traditional holding congregation, and we have been given a clergywoman. It's usually a clergywoman. Sometimes it's a clergyman uh, who is who is coming in as a social justice warrior, and we can't stay here anymore. Where where do we go? Uh, and the difficulty is that the number of parishes that that existed as foxholes is, is diminishing rapidly. And part of the problem is they're not letting in clergy who, who are orthodox at the beginning of the process. So the only ones who are being churned out appear to be ones who subscribe to the present agenda, as you would expect from an organization setting out to do what they're doing. So George, what you're saying is 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 true, but it's not it's not a solution that will well you you didn't say it would last for a long time, but it's it's not even it, it's only partially available and, and it's not covering the pain of people having their churches, their spirituality, their access to God corporately taken away from them. I yeah. agree with you, Gavin, and, but where I'm coming from is basically, okay, what do we, uh, that pain is going to exist. Uh, if you are in a position where your parish is not strong enough or financially independent enough in an American context to call your own rector, you'll get somebody who is otherwise unemployable that will drive your church out of business. And where do you go? If you're the only church in the county, if you're the only church within driving distance, basically people stop going to church. Uh, that's, yeah. that's, the, that's the Episcopal way. They don't join other churches. They stop going to church. Um, what's the solution? Well, I, this is a, a difficult thing to answer, but you've got to be strong enough on the local level to know exactly who you are and what you want and don't put yourself in the position. Now that doesn't resolve the press the problem of those in such a position already, which unfortunately is the majority. Uh, how much? What percentage has of the Church of England parishes have less than sixty people in a church on Sunday? Isn't it the overwhelming majority? Oh, hu hugely so. Yes. Uh, yeah, those churches are not financially self-sustaining unless they have inherited money. Um, in other words, they can't make the they can't make the wheels go around with sixty people, and that's true of the American Episcopal Church as well. Um, without outside resources. There's got to be a shakeup. There's got to be something. And right now, I'm actually calling for to be Samson. Pull the house down. Bankrupt diocese. Don't send your money to these institutions that are wasting them. Um, because you, there needs to be this traumatic revolution uh, in order to clear away the detritus of the Episcopal Church, the Presbyterian Church, the Methodist Church in the United States, the Lutheran Churches, we're all going through the same problem, and we're all trying to figure out what's the solution. Well, one of the things, you know, the three of us to discuss many times is what is the solution for England or British Church? Let, let, let's say that. What's, what's going to be the ultimate solution in Britain uh, for an Orthodox Church to rise up? We've seen that GAFCON tried to start something. We see that um, other organizations have tried to to start things and there's just no spark that gets gets the fire going would the collapse which i think is coming within you know certainly this generation of the church of england or the uh disestablishment of that church as a state church uh allow for a spark to finally start it might but it can't happen because it's too legally complex and it will take too many too many resources but i do think kevin you've raised something very important perhaps one of the most prophetic things we've ever dealt with um, I, I, I go on saying, and not because it's my opinion, but because I, I think it's what I perceive, that that we're called we're being called to a new reformation. But it's it's so different from the last reformation, it's really hard to understand or to see. I mean, in the same way, I think that, that Luther in nineteen in, in, in fifteen seventeen 
would have been hard put to see what Germany was going to look like in 25 years' time. Right. Yeah, I agree. Uh, and I think that's where we are at the moment. But the ingredient ought to be, as far as I can see, a, a renewal of ecumenical intimacy across the old borders between Catholics, Anglicans, Baptists, Pentecostals, for those who people who who don't accept the perversion of Christianity at the hands of either Islamic culture or progressive culture. Now that means that we have to, there are things we have to stop arguing about between ourselves. We have to stop arguing about 16th century issues and begin to be discerning 21st century issues. I mean, one of them, for example, ought to be that all the churches in Great Britain ought to be coming together in, 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 in a in a powerful protest against the marginalization of Christians in the employment sector and the and the death and destruction of Christians across the world in other countries. But you don't hear General Synod saying uh, the most important thing at the moment on our consciences is, is the marginalization of and the persecution of Christians. And yet it's probably ought to be one of the most important things. And what it represents is not just pain and the price of discipleship, but it represents tectonic plates from two different areas crushing the church. So just in terms of survival, we need to have a reconfiguration between Catholics and Protestants and Pentecostals in order to resist um, not what Justin Welby reckon, uh, interprets as, as the lion prowling around, uh, but, but actually the real demonic activity, which is the silencing, wounding, and destroying of the body of Christ. Now, if we could do that, we might find enough in common to, to, to re-energize Christ's church and to pick up the agenda he's given us for the 21st century that stretches beyond our immediate communities and beyond our immediate countries. One of my prejudices is, and among the many that viewers have pointed out, uh, is my belief in competition. Uh, I have viewers who have written saying, can't we adopt a Church of South India approach of having all the Protestant denominations put aside their differences? That's a wonderful idea in theory, but then you have the problem that the Church of South India is one of the most corrupt organizations. It's financially corrupt. Its offices are bought and sold, and there's no competition to keep it clean. If you're a Protestant, there's basically no other place to go but the Catholic Church or one of the uh, traditional churches. So there needs to be the sort of energy that uh, competition provides so that you don't have wind up with being the only show in town. You gradually de degenerate without enough members to be self-supporting, and then you can be taken over. We need to have some form of competition amongst thriving Christian groups, but we don't need to have the animosity and uh, hatred. I, I'm trying to th uh, th uh, thread the needle, uh, so to speak, and I don't know if I did a very good job. No, you, you're doing fine. I think one of the things, especially in Europe, is I don't think the European church as a whole has recovered from the French Revolution. They're afraid of what culture and society has the capability to do to a church. And I think you see that in the same with the Church of England, that they really listen closely to what the culture is saying because we don't want to offend them. Look what offending culture can lead to. Look what, you know, that they'll, they'll just kick us out. They'll take our heads off. They'll burn our churches. They'll steal our artwork. You know, and so there's, I think there's this built in fear in, in European churches of what happens if we don't listen. And so, yes, competition is important. I say that as a capitalist, uh, as uh, I love my IT competition in the area, uh, and it makes me a better uh, capitalist, a better business owner. And in the same way, having competition, uh, certainly on the denomination level, uh, is very helpful. The... Uh... The Episcopal Church, uh, I, I do want to, I am an Episcopalian, I have no plans of leaving, uh, but it increases its trajectory into lunacy. We had uh, the consecration service uh, the, of the new Bishop of Michigan, uh, Bonnie Perry, who is a partnered lesbian woman. Mm -hmm. 
And the Bishop of Indianapolis, a black woman, Jennifer, Jennifer Baskerville Burroughs, gave her sermon and she highlighted the greatest threats facing Episcopal Church and American religious life today are transphobia, white supremacy, and I think the Trump administration. Not uh, Anglican yeah. Unscripted, the three white men on Anglican Unscripted? Oh, surely we made the cut. <laughs> no, but here's, here's the thing. You know, we've got a bishop who our tradition teaches us is an apostolic line uh, from uh, Peter on down. Peter on down. Now, let's not get into the women's side issue, of course, but, you know, in theory, we've got this, but now, who in that congregation who listened to that was coming from a small town church in central Michigan, you know, would give any credence whatsoever? I mean, this is just eye-rollingly awful, and but we've reached a point where it doesn't matter. The, the local parish life will go on. They'll roll their eyes at the latest lunacy that the uh, with it a clergy and churches do that may have some residual inherited money. But the work of the church goes on day by day, person by person, and we shall overcome in time. We may not be popular. We may not be elected to office. We may not uh, be the right smart set, but we have the truth. And we're growing, and they're not. I, I think those are. Shall I get off my soapbox now? And no, no, no. Well, well let's change the topic. We, we talked about what the Church of England is doing today. They're on an apology tour, so to speak, for their statement on uh, civil partnerships and uh, same-sex marriages, and they're really upset that they released it, and they're sorry of how. Uh, people were offended by it, and they understand why people were offended by it. And it's really hard to find a person who admits they were even part of writing it. That's how sorry they were. Now they said, listen, ignore what we've done here. Just ignore this statement because something's coming. We've been working really hard on the next statement that's coming out. And oh, God forbid we have to apologize for that statement. But there's a new statement coming out. What's it called, Gavin? It's called LLF. So oh, LLF. LLF is a cool way. Everyone says LLF. Living in love. What is it? L living in love and faith. LLF. Living in love and faith is the next statement coming out. And this is going to be the very best example of Indaba. This is going to be the very best in example of working with the LGBTQ uh, ministries. This is going to be the very best that the Church of England can offer. This is going to include a revolution in the uh, gospel ideas behind uh, sex and lust and how we identify ourselves in, in spiritual redefinition. That's what's coming. And I look forward to it as a journalist. Can't wait to see uh, something like, like that to come across my desk so we can talk about it. But I think it's kind of a, almost, you know, next meeting itis that they're trying to perpetuate here, uh, which we found uh, under the Ro Rowan administration. Um, well, certainly w w what Rowan was trying to do was to keep the whole show together. And, and, and Welby is now taking that on uh, uh, to the next stage. And General Synod had a presentation on what is to be expected next summer. Um, and I was very pleased because I thought they've got to give the game away. Um, it's, a, it's a fairly carefully planned strategy. So. It will be codified, but if we listen to the code, it maybe we'll know what's going to happen. And I'm delighted to say that in 15 minutes, the code was was set out there, and I understand it. So we now I can tell you what's going to happen in in, in 2020, and it's 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 what we thought, but the terms in which what we thought uh, have become clearer. And so so the the first thing, of course, is that sex traditionally has been taken as uh, a competing god and a responsibility. So as sexualized creatures, it gives us a responsibility to procreate within the family and then to realize that, that it's such a powerful thing in our makeup as one of our appetites that it needs to be struggled with and contained. Well, that's gone now because the new, the, the new definition of what we're doing is how to be human, how to be sexual, and how to be made in the image of God. But this is, of course, a new God. <laughs> this is the God who validates sexual appetites. So once again, right at the beginning, we have a familiar word, 
but it means something different. So when they talk about the image of God, guys, be careful. They don't mean the incarnate Logos. They mean something different. Then we're going to be told that that the Pope process is about engaging with difference. Well, um, that's code for we're going to bring in a new sexual uh, a new sexual framework, and if you don't like it, you must live with it. Uh, then well, there's no, going to be you, a if you don't like it, you're the problem. Absolutely, but okay. but but engaging but engaging with difference is code for when mm. you find something that doesn't suit you, live with it and shut up. Or better still, like it and affirm it. But whatever happens, don't don't critique it. Then wonderfully comes the biblical language. We're issuing a call to repentance, but it's repentance from your old prejudices. The trouble is what they recognize of as prejudices, we recognize as reading scripture and accepting the limitations on our appetites. That's become a prejudice. So th then um, they... Uh, they, they put themselves as the via media. And they say, we have people saying, you must radically change on one side and stand firm on the other. Those are the traditionalists. And we're not going to do either. We're going to help you all live together. Essentially, what they're saying is um, that the heterodox people aren't going to uh, have complete control of the church, but the traditionalists must be quiet and accept the heterodox. Because, of course, it's, it isn't a via media at all. It's a three-card three trick. Then they say, we're going to discover something quite wonderful. We're going to be transformed into not talking about permanent, faithful, loving relationships as we have been. That's a bit passe. We're all up with that now. Uh, anyone, that, you know, whatever permanent means, it means more than tomorrow. Uh, and loving means sleeping with someone I love. <clears throat> um, and relationships at the moment still mean only two people, but perhaps not for very much longer. But anyway, this is still passe because the new agenda is going to be not relationships between people, but across church communities and families. I think this is a new ecclesiology which says we're going, no one's allowed to leave because we must accept one another. Our call is to a new commitment to one another. Quite what's new <laughs> about this, I'm not sure. But I think it's a new context of, of sexual pluriformity. And they then said, the person who sums it up most was in a meeting where, where one person looked at the rest of us and said, it has now become unthinkable to me for us to part company. Basically, that means don't leave the Church of England because you will be betraying people who don't want you to part company. Ne next, it says the Church will embark on something new to reach beyond our own echo chambers. So a position of conviction has become an echo chamber where you have to allow it to be diluted by the new progressive agenda. Uh, our narratives are to be enriched by stories of lived experience. That means our Christian anthropology becomes wholly existential and defined by appetite instead of defined by resisting appetite, which was the old way that the church did it for 2,000 years. And then you'll be pleased to know this will lead us into conversations that lead us to Jesus' will for his church. Because the gospel is full of Jesus saying, you can manage your sexual appetite as you like and sleep with whoever you want to as long as you mean it and you don't have to put anything to death if it's uncomfortable. It's that, it's that Jesus, you know, that, that one. Uh, and then finally, how you need to ask by the time we get to next summer how you personally are going to embody eagerness and openness and vulnerability and become a catalyst for change in this new church. So that's living in love and faith. That's that's what it's going to be all about. And and the reason they were so upset about the bishop's statement, well, because it involved a dogmatic statement of discipline and truth. And that's not the language of Welby's church, because you can disagree about that and you might then um you might then uh fall out about it on matter of principle. In this new church, it's just a matter of accepting everyone as they are in a new commitment to one another's existential authenticity. So I imagine this is going to be published with a, a black cover with a big yellow background to the cover that says Gnosticism for Dummies. Well, it uh, would be, Kevin, if, if, but that would give people, that would give a, a sitting target, and they don't plan to give you a sitting target because this is going to be a process. Kevin, it's going to be a tool for you to develop and to grow. At no point will they say, this is how you must be as the church. You can critique it because you're going to be on a journey, Kevin, a journey of 
self-discovery, of the discovery of others. You're, you're going to be able to hear about my, my inner sexual fantasies and needs, and you're going to sit with me whilst I, you know, that, that's where the authenticity is going to lie, Kevin. There's no end to this process. Well, there isn't, because we, the key thing is a person's going to go to their, their rector or priest or whatever uh, council they have and say, what does God want of me? And the new answer from the Church of England is going to be, well, what do you lust for? Yes. <laughs> that's, that's the thing. Tell, tell us what your authentic appetites are. Yeah. And, and what then... do you lust for? Ah, well, okay. Well, l- let me just slide, talk about my more favorite thing about uh, politics now. What do we do about that? This will come out before the Lambeth Conference, I believe. And the Lambeth Conference will be asked, Welby will try to give it a very hard push for the Lambeth Conference to approve this as the model for inter-Anglican relations. Yeah. Uh, that we, are, we uh, see the Church of England is the model for the rest of the Anglican world. Now, this is an utter fiasco. It's horrible. It will lead to the death. The, it, it will kill the church even faster. There's been no recorded instance in any religious group of which I'm unaware that this approach has led to an increase in membership. Now, that's actually good news politically. We have a problem of the Gafcon primates, many of them staying away from Lambeth out of issues of conviction, the Nigerians, Ugandans, Rwandans. So we're losing a critical mass of about 300 bishops who can shoot this down. So those GAFCON-affiliated primates and bishops who are going have a special responsibility not to be played and turned into fools. And that's what they, that's many of them have been rather foolish. They have, they're excited by the exposure, they're excited by all the psychobabble. They don't understand that they are being played as suckers. And for those who have the wisdom to lead the conservatives who are showing up at Lambeth, if they don't act appropriately, they will have forfeited any credibility that they have as Christian leaders. The church is moving forward with or without them, and if these guys who are on the fence decide that the fence is the safest place to be, history will pass them by. It's going to be very difficult, I think, for Christian Orthodox bishops at Lambeth because the, the only thing they can do is to disagree. But of course, by, by disagreeing, you, you break the golden rule of, of Christian unity, the integrity of process over truth. And the one thing that, that Anglicanism under Welby doesn't do is it doesn't do propositional truth. It's all about authentic relationships and not, that's, and that's not breaking important. them. This is what's happened. This is what happened in 98, that the script was tossed out. I was there. I was the typist who typed Lambeth Resolution 1.10 at the section on human sexuality. It was in my hot little hands that this thing was done. And I saw it from the inside as uh, one of the privates in this war. And it w- and the head of the section was a white South African who sought to change this, to, uh, to mollify this, to do basically the company business. And the Africans and the conservatives led by the Sydney bishops revolted and wouldn't stand for it. And once that dam was burst, the vast majority of fellow traveler bishops who don't really know what's going on, who don't have the, who don't have the experience to understand how these synods work, as soon as they saw the direction in which it was going and what the, what the consequences were, they stood up and took the battle home, such that George Carey, at the end of the day, joined the winning side and gave it his imprimatur. I don't think that's impossible, except, and that's why I was against uh, sort of this boycott business, because you hand the victory over to the other side prematurely. Well, I mean, a lot but of it times... Is possible, it is possible to derail the Welby agenda. These guys just, excuse my language, they just have to have the balls to do it and not seek to be, go along to get along. I mean... It, One of the things I saw at the, at the last Lambeth... It's pitiful sometimes. The, the, the uh, well, I'll stop. Yeah. I'm being well, the, the, the last couple Lambeth, it's like three-card Monty. You know, they'll, they'll put the uh, conservative Orthodox bishops over here 
over here, they'll make all the decisions and put out their little communique. They'll pass out the communique to everybody. And everybody doesn't have time to read it or understand what it was all about. And boom, it's out to the, the world. But what we saw in 98 was when if you have the temerity to stand up and say, this will not stand. The bureaucratic machine is caught in its tracks because Absolutely. they are Agreed. they are used to timid, not particularly bright, go along, get along bishops. We're talking about the Church of England. Mm -hmm. And when you've got people who will stand up and say, this is unbiblical, unscriptural, we walk and we walk away from you and call you non-Christians unless we take this and hash this out thoroughly. That changed Lambeth 98. The whole Indaba in 2008 was to prevent that from happening again. And we didn't have the same leadership as we had with Peter Akinola, uh, I'm not sorry, Peter Akinola, uh, at the same leadership we had in 98, it was watered down. And my fear is this time around, it's watered down even further. And we're not going to have that man who will stand up or woman who will stand up and say, this will not stand. Yeah. Well, I think you and I can agree Oh, the three of us can agree the Church of England is on a trajectory to to oblivion. Yeah, I would place a sell order right now uh, with your <laughs> <Sell>. broker. <laughs> call, In fact, sell, I would short call, the call. stock. I would short the stock. <laughs> yeah, I would short it too. I think that's a, that's a good point. They are a principal leader within the Anglican Communion as far as the culture is concerned. And uh, so we're going to have to see if they can maintain that as they crash. I don't know. But see there, now let's not paint this entirely dark. Let's say we do have a fiasco of a Lambeth. Nods are we will. What does that mean? It means that it will get so bad that those people who've stepped back will now have to step forward. And what we'll see is the Archbishop of Canterbury dethroned as the automatic leader of the Anglican world. It's been talked about, to my knowledge, since the Jerusalem Primates Conference in uh, I think that was 97, yeah. Since the Jerusalem's Primates Conference in 97, there's been talk of, well, why do we automatically have someone appointed by the British Prime Minister, the head of this religious organization? Should he not be chosen from amongst us archbishops? And it's always sort of shoved back and there's always something else to talk about. That issue uh, rises to the top. And then once that rises to the top, you've changed the game so that it's worthwhile for the Nigerians to play ball. And once you have that game changed, then you'll have a conservative primate and you'll have, in essence, a repeat of Dar es Salaam. You'll have a repeat of Alexandria. You'll have a repeat of these meetings where the Episcopal Church and the left has been given an ultimatum, but was sabotaged by the Archbishop of Canterbury. This time around, you'll have, if everything falls apart and they elect a new strong leader, you'll have the ultimatum, plus you'll have the person who'll be willing to enforce it. I should mention that we've not received any illegal draft copies of LLF yet. If you want to look in the show notes, you'll see our contact information. If you have a copy you want to give us, that would be wonderful. So we could uh, just have a, a preview of what's, what's coming, and I, I would appreciate that. Gentlemen, we're at 45 minutes which is our standard stop time. I know it's always going to be 17 minutes in my mind, but it never really happens. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashland, and you'll be listening to episode 573 on the 11th of February, 2020.